This is from, uh, this is from Paul's uh, writing to Philippians, where he talks about imitating Christ's humility. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded and having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Thanks, Andrew. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for how it teaches us more about you and how it teaches us how to live. And I pray, Lord, that you would take this time and you would speak to us, help us to understand more about who we are as individuals and as your body, as your family. Lord, please give me the strength to do this and take this time. It's yours. Do whatever you'd like with it. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week in our discussion about the church as a whole, we it mentioned how there is no such thing as an isolated, solitary Christian. And though there are example, exceptions in extraordinary times, by and large, Christians are not meant to live their faith, not meant to live their lives alone. God has given us the church in order to foster community, in order to foster unity, to be a place where we can experience the communion of the saints. And this week's line that we're going to study from the Apostles' Creed is, I believe in the communion of saints. This might seem like a bit of a redundancy from last week's topic about the church, but I think our topic this week explores deeper what we are to be to each other as the body of Christ, as the people of God, as the, as the temple of the Holy Spirit, as the church. The communion of the saints is what is to happen inside the church. It speaks to the development of community, the, the growth and preservation of unity among believers. Now, community is something that's pretty high on the list of what I find young people and young adults are looking for. I think it's something we're all looking for, particularly in the last two generations as we've seen the prevalence of divorce and the breakdown of the family unit, that, that basic unit of community that, that God created for us to live within. People are looking for alternate forms of community, informal linkages of friends that will provide uh, for the needs that the family would normally provide. The other basic form of community that God has created us to live in is the church. We are called to be a community, a communion of saints, a people who live in unity. For when we live in community, we live out the image of God in our lives. For God himself is a community a community of love where the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit live in eternal unity. When we live in the communion of the saints, when we live in community, we are reflecting the image of God to the world around us. Yet the way we do church in the 21st century isn't always the best way to foster community. We come into a room and we sit at pews and we stare at the back of people's heads. Um, it's hard to find community when you only see the back of people's heads, when you don't know their names, when you don't know their stories. That's why I always get you to stand up and move and go and talk to each other for the middle of the service. That's why we stand at the back after the service and we hang around together and, and have coffee and refreshments. I mean, it's not about the food. I mean, I could be at Red Rice in five minutes and have food and something to drink. It's not, it's not the food. Although, remember, it is always good. Never turn down free food. That's very important. But the point is having the opportunity to talk to each other, having the opportunity to, to be together, having the opportunity to build community and to build community across the generations. Larry Crabb is one of my favorite authors, and he's written a book called Becoming a True Spiritual Community. And I'm going to be drawing some of his points into my sermon this morning. And in it, he paints a picture of a spiritual community that turns their chairs to face each other. 
Rather than an image of a Sunday morning where we're all staring at the back of people's heads, he paints a picture of a community that faces each other, that listens to each other, that cares for each other. The way we do church in the 21st century doesn't always foster community, sometimes because of the same reasons that community broke down in the church in the first century. Paul warned and reproached the churches that he wrote to for such things as gossip. Rumors spread about people that were untrue, or, or maybe that were true, but really shouldn't be said. Gossip breaks down community. He reproached them for dissensions. Dissensions are disagreements between people in the church community, but they take the disagreements one step further. These are disagreements where people share their disagreement and unhappiness with others who are not really involved, and they build a broader dissatisfaction within the community. They stir up drama and conflict when there was none. Dissensions break down community. The scripture also warns against factions. This is dissension taken one step further where the community begins to break down into identifiable groups centered on what they're unhappy about and, and begin to pit groups against each other. Factions break down community. And when we break down community, we're tarnishing the image of God. We are hampering the communion of the saints. So how do we go about creating this community? Well, strictly speaking, we don't. We, we can't. We, we create opportunities for community to flourish. We, we protect community. We guard it. We look after it. But, but we don't create it. God does. And God does it by the work of his Holy Spirit. We read Ephesians 4.3. And it tells us to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. It doesn't tell us to create unity. It doesn't tell us to manufacture unity or to conjure it up somehow. It says keep it. To keep to guard, to protect something the Holy Spirit has already given to us. Eugene Peterson, the author of the message paraphrase of the Bible, who passed away last year, he writes, the formation of community is the intricate, patient, painful work of the Holy Spirit. We cannot buy community. We cannot make community. We can only offer ourselves to become community. Diedrich Bonhoeffer, the 20th century German pastor and theologian, writes, Our community with one another consists solely in what Christ has done for both of us. Community is a gift of the Holy Spirit to the church. It's something we already have. Unity is the default position of the church, of a group of Christians. Our job as the body of Christ is to keep that unity, to take care of it, to preserve it. It's our job not to mess things up. And the previous verse in Ephesians gives us some hints on how to mess, how not to mess things up, how not to mess up unity. It says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. This is the opposite of factions and gossip and dissensions. As we live in humility towards each other with gentleness and with patience, we protect community. And as we bear with one another and as we make every effort to keep unity, we can experience the communion of the saints that, that God has called us to, that we are meant to live. The honesty of these phrases really strikes me. It says, bear with one another, make every effort. This tells me that preserving unity isn't always easy. We have to bear with, bear with each other in the body of Christ because honestly, some of us can be difficult to get along with, myself included. And we have to make every effort at keeping unity because there will be times when, honestly, we won't feel like wanting to be in unity and unified with that person. But we do it. And we protect unity in the spirit because it's something worth protecting. It creates the community that our lives are lacking. It builds a community that one cannot find anywhere else because that community is built on the foundation of God's spirit. And that's unique. And that's worth protecting. Like I said last week, without the Holy Spirit bringing us together as a community, then we're just a nice bunch of nice people who get together on Sunday mornings and go out and try and do nice things. And if that's all we are, then we might as well just close down and join the Lions Club. Without the unity given by the Holy Spirit, there's nothing special or different about us. We're studying 1 John on Tuesday nights, 
at our Bible discussion at Chris and Erica's house at 717 on Tuesday. And chapter one talks about, talks a lot about the word fellowship, about coming together in communion with each other. In verse three, John writes that our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. And later he tells us that God is light. And then the key verse is in verse seven, where he says, if we walk in the light, as God is the light, we have fellowship with one another. Our community is based on our individual decisions to live our lives in the light of Jesus Christ and to live our lives following him. It's a, it is that commonality that brings us together in a communion of saints that can, can make a difference in our lives and can make a difference in the lives of the people around us. One difference that the community of saints makes is that it helps us grow closer to God and to serve God better. Hebrews 10, 24, 25 tells us that as the body of Christ, tells us as the body of Christ to consider how we might spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. When I read the word spur, I mean, Grace would know better because she's a horse person, but I think of those little metal thingies that cowboys wear on the end of their boots, you know, and then when the horse, they want the, go, the horse to go faster or the horse to go in a certain direction, they just kind of give them a little kick with the spur and let them know what they want them to do. We are to spur one another on to love and good deeds, to give each other a nudge towards doing good deeds for each other and for those in the world who are in need of a practical demonstration of who Jesus Christ is. We need to give each other a gentle kick when we go off track, to, to remind each other to love each other as Jesus would love. C.S. Lewis wrote the Chronicle Narnia, Nar, the Nar, Chronicles of Narnia, which started off with the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. And C.S. Lewis writes, spiritual community is a good laboratory for discovering God. As we do life together and discover how God is working in our lives, Living in community gives us the opportunity to share what God is doing in our lives, to, to teach each other and to encourage each other. Living in community helps us to gain insight into the scriptures and to share with each other what we feel the scriptures mean and what, they're, what the significance of the scriptures are in our lives. Living in community guides us in our prayer lives as we pray for others. Living in community encourages us in our walk with God. Larry Crabb writes, Togetherness in Christ encourages movement towards Christ. Proverbs 27, 17 tells us, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. As we come together in community, there will be times when we come into contact with each other. And in those times, we have a choice. Are we going to come into contact with each other and rub each other the wrong way? Are we going to come into contact with each other and create conflict? Or are we going to come into contact with each other and sharpen each other? Will we help each other know God better, serve God better, follow God better? As we live in community, we are meant to sharpen each other so that we will grow closer to God and serve him better. Living in community also means being, make, being aware of the needs of others, and it gives us opportunities to, to help in whatever way the Lord enables us. Galatians chapter 6, verses 2 and 10 tells us to carry each other's burdens, and in this way we fulfill the law of Christ. So therefore, as we, it says as we, in verse 10, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people especially to those who are part of the family of believers. See, when we live solitary, isolated lives, it's, it's kind of safe. We don't expose ourselves to the needs of others. We don't expose our needs to other people. And when we do that, we at best become indifferent to those around us, and at worst, we become self-centered. God has placed us in community so that we will live with an awareness to look beyond ourselves and beyond our needs. And as that awareness grows, then we're called to do something about what we're made aware of, to carry each other's burdens, to do good to others within the community of believers, most definitely, but also beyond these four walls, to those outside the communion of saints. Philippians 2, 3, and 4, which Andrew read for us, encourages us to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility, value others better than yourselves. 
not looking to your own interests, but each of you look to the interests of others. Living in community as God has created us is to live, is an exercise in humility. It's an exercise in eliminating self-centeredness from our lives. Jean Vanier is a Canadian who founded the, the L'Arche community for the developmentally disabled. And he writes, community is the place where your ego goes to die. Community is the place where your ego goes to die. Living in the communion of saints means that we learn to live lives that are focused beyond our needs and to look to the needs of others. Living in community as God desires for us to live also means being a place where it's safe to take off your mask. Where it's safe to take off your mask. A number of years ago when I was still working with Youth for Christ, I felt there was a need in Port Hope for some kind of ministry for young adults, for people between the ages of 18 and 30, because they were kind of scattered amongst all the different churches, a couple here, a couple there. No one church could do a young adult's ministry, so I thought, Maybe we need to do something that pulls everyone together. And I met at Tim Hortons up on Toronto Road with a young lady from Calvary Church who was in that age group. And we took out a napkin and we wrote down the names of 30 people that we thought of, could think of between the ages of 18 and 30 in Port Hope who could benefit from some kind of ministry at that age group. And then I sent them all an email with a question. And the question is, what would you consider to be the most important element or some of the most important elements in a church young adults group. And I received a diversity of answers and there was no one answer that was the majority, but there was one answer that came up more than any other. And when it did, they all used exactly the same phrase and it really struck me. And they all said, these, these few that said this, they said that in a church young adults group, they were looking for a safe place. The communion of saints should be a safe place. Notice I didn't say a comfortable place, because when iron sharpens iron, it's not always comfortable. But it should be a safe place. And sadly, the church is often not a safe place. Many years ago, a colleague in ministry who was an assistant pastor on staff at a large church was really struggling with some issues, and he needed help, so he reached out to his pastor, who was his boss, for help and support. And instead of getting the support he needed, he got fired. Young adults in particular don't see the church as a safe place to, to admit mistakes, to admit failures, to ask questions, to admit they don't know. They don't see it as a safe place to let down their mask and show that they're broken. Last Sunday, I was talking up the Tuesday Bible study that takes place at Chris and Erica's at 717 on Toronto Road this Tuesday. And um, so I was talking to some people and I was explaining what we were going to be doing. And one person, one, someone looked at me and he, and he said, can I be honest? There's a sense in the church that we sometimes have that everyone else has it so together that I would be ashamed to be honest. I would be ashamed to admit that I don't. So I just put on my mask and I just play along with everybody else. Now, I'm not saying that we should unburden ourselves to, like, everybody and unburden everything to everybody. I'm not saying we should create one big pity party where we just wallow in how bad our lives are. But if we're honest, each one of us is struggling with something. Each one of us is broken in some way. I mean, Jesus has forgiven us, and he's in the process of healing us, but sometimes that process is long and the broken part of us takes some time to mend. Or sometimes there's a broken part of our lives that we just haven't given over to Jesus yet and it's still broken. And I'm not saying we blurt out all our mess to every, in our lives to everyone, but in the church there should be some place that you can find that is safe. Someone or some small group of people where you can safely be honest safely take off your mask, safely display your brokenness and ask for help. And in the church, there should be some place where you will find people who will pray for you and encourage you and walk with you and cry with you and support you and carry your burdens. Larry Crabb writes this, a central task of community is to create a place that is safe enough for walls to be torn down safe enough for each of us to own and reveal our brokenness. 
Only then can the power of connecting do its job. Only then can community be used of God to restore our souls. We've been given an awesome gift and responsibility as the communion of saints. We've been given the opportunity to be used of God to help heal brokenness, to help bring restoration and life to others through the unity of the Spirit. May this church be seen as a safe place where people can find healing in community. The communion of saints is created by God with the express purpose of bringing others into the community. And again, that's where sometimes churches in the 21st century don't live up to the community that we've been called to be. It's tempting when we've created a safe, nurturing, healing circle to kind of close that circle tight and not let anyone else in. After all, we don't want to upset the unity. When I first started youth pastoring, I was working at Calvary Pentecostal Church when they were up on Toronto Road, which is the same street that the Bible study is going to be on Tuesday night at 717. And I noticed a phenomenon among my youth after church on Sunday. They would stand in a circle of, say, eight to ten teens and just hang out and talk with each other in this circle. And if someone entered that circle uninvited, especially an adult, the circle would kind of gradually dissolve and each would go on their own way or would break into other smaller circles. As a youth pastor, I, after about a year, I knew I had made it in with them when I could walk into the circle and be welcomed into it. And sometimes we could be like that as the church. We like our circle. We are experiencing communion of the saints in our circle. But then someone new wanders in to our circle, someone who's not like us, someone who does things differently than we do, someone who senses the safety of the circle because the work of the Holy Spirit is there and, and, and begins to take off their mask and we're not quite ready for that because it kind of unnerves us. Ooh, they're being really honest here. And our circle breaks down and we retreat into a new safe place without the intruder. C.S. Lewis writes, there is no greater temptation than the urge to create an inner ring of community that was special because it excludes. There's a reason why God has given us the gift of community. Yes, it's so that we can find strength and safety and grow in God and find deep relationships with others, but we are given all of these blessings for a reason, and that's to go and welcome others into the community. We grow within ourselves so that we can grow outward and invite people in. And as we reach out beyond ourselves to welcome others into this spiritual community, that very act will grow and foster community amongst ourselves. Kenyon Callahan, in his book about new beginnings for congregations, writes simply that people who are helping other people get along with each other better. People who are helping other people get along with each other better. Mission breeds unity. A church that is working together to, to reach out to others with the gospel. A church that is working together to meet the needs of the community. That church will find its members develop yet one more thing they've got in common. And as they work together, the communion of the saints grows stronger. And the bond of love between them grows tighter. They not only have kept the unity of the Spirit, but they've, they've built on the foundation the Spirit has given them. And they've made their unity even stronger. And out of that, they discover more about God and what he wants to do in them and through them to make a difference in this world for Christ. It's my deep desire that this communion of saints would grow together in community by growing together in mission. That our unity would deepen as we work together to discover what ministry is it that God has called each of us as individuals to do what ministry God has called us as a church to do, and to work together with the direction of the Holy Spirit to see what comes to life and, and to make a difference in the lives of others. Because God has given each one of you sitting here a mission. God has given each one of you a gift. God has given each one of you an, maybe an idea for reaching beyond yourselves to touch others with the gospel and the love of Jesus Christ. And as we share those ideas in community, you might discover that, hey, 
Someone else has exactly the same idea, and you can come together and work together, and one plus one equals three, and you accomplish more together than you ever could apart. You work together so to see the spark of an idea come to fruition so that you can bless the lives of others. And in the process, that helps each of you grow in community. For God has called us to spiritual community with him and with each other. It isn't an option, it's a command. But far more than that, it's the greatest privilege and greatest joy we've been given. And it's a joy and a privilege that we can offer to others, welcoming, welcoming them to live in the light of Christ, welcoming them to join us in the communion of the saints. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, I thank you for this family, the body of Christ here at First Baptist Church on the corner of John and Augusta. We thank you for the body of Christ that's meeting up on Croft Street at Calvary Pentecostal and up on Centennial Road at Grace Missionary and just over the Ruth Clark Center at the Kingdom Life Fellowship. We thank you, Lord, for the family of God in this town. And we thank you, Lord, for the communion of saints here. And I pray, Lord, as you have been doing, that you would continue to bind us together, that you would continue to help us to reach beyond ourselves, to get to know each other better, to hear our stories, to pray for each other, to find ways that together we can serve you. We can grow closer to you by working together to serve others. Lord, protect us. Keep us from things that, that we might do as humans to, that would mess up the unity you've already given us. Help us, Lord, to be humble and gentle and patient with each other, to bear with each other, to make every effort to protect the unity you've already given us. Lord, please keep us from the temptation to live isolated lives. Help us, Lord, to connect with each other here in the body of Christ. And keep us, Lord, from the temptation of enjoying our little circle too much. Help us, Lord, to be able to invite others in. And help us, Lord, to be able to drop the masks. Help us, Lord, to find safe places and safe people here that we could ask for prayer with. We can ask for help. We could ask for support. Give us the, discern the gift of discernment, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, that we may know um, how we can be of help to others. Thank you, Lord, for this community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.